What I have sort of landed on is this idea of dharma is equal to essence plus expression. Hmm. And, and essence is who you are, and expression is how you show up in the world. And really dharma is an alignment of who you are with how you show up. And so the closest your, your, your essence and expression are to one another, the more aligned you are with your dharma. Hello, and welcome to the Meta Hour podcast with Sharon Salzberg. I'm Lily Cushman. I produce this podcast. And today we're bringing you episode 235, Sharon speaking with author and speaker Sunil Gupta. Sunil's latest book has just come out in the fall of 2023, Everyday Dharma, Eight Essential Practices for Finding Success and Joy in Everything You Do. He is a best-selling author a public speaker, a Harvard Medical School visiting scholar, and the host of a global documentary series. And much of today's conversation is centered around the teachings of his new book and how growing up in Detroit as an Indian man, he found the teachings of his grandfather and the Hindu world and really integrated that into his life and into this book. And a lot of this conversation is looking at the ways that we can really apply spiritual teachings in our lives, in our work. Sunil was once considered the face of failure by the New York Times, which he shares the story of. And just the way that he's applied the teachings of the Dharma as a way to not just work with the failure he's encountered, but to find a different kind of internal joy and internal success as well as external success. A few of the things that Sharon and Sunil talk about, Dr. King's street sweeper story, and Sunil's journey as a brown-skinned man growing up in the U.S., working with writing as a therapeutic format, and this notion of a rival fallacy, which is super interesting. They go through the different pillars in Sunil's book, of which there are eight, and also just the way that the spiritual path is not linear by any means, and the necessity of connection and community in our lives, and the role that vulnerability plays in promoting connection. So this is a rich conversation, and we're going to dive right in. Sharon Salzberg and Sunil Gupta. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Sharon, it's so nice to be here. It's so nice to sort of more fully meet than we have before. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like I've known you for a very long time. I've been learning from your teachings, and I know connecting with you virtually, so it's really nice to do this with you. Oh, well, that's lovely. Where are you recording from today? Are you in L.A.? I am in my basement on a, <laughs> a, 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 a with my golden doodle on an unusually oh. yeah yeah on an unusually rainy day in Los Angeles. Wow, what's the doggy's name? Doggy's name is Noe, and if you hear him at some point in time, he's looking at me right now. At some point in time, <laughs> he, he he may ask to go out, and I'll get up and let him out. But for right now, he's providing me with some much needed rainy day companionship. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, it's wonderful to be together, and I'm looking forward to being able to speak today. Yeah, likewise. So you have a new book that came out towards the end of 2023 yeah. called Everyday Dharma, Eight Essential Practices for Finding Success and Joy in What You Do. It's published by Harper One in September of 2023. So first of all, a big congratulations to you. It's really a feat to bring a book into the world especially with all the chaos that's happening these days. Yeah, th thank you. And thanks for giving it an early read. You were one of the very first people who took a look at it, and I was so grateful for that. And and um, I'm so happy with the way that the book turned out. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's out in the world now, which is always sort of, as you know, as an author, is kind of one of those things where it's like you never really feel finished. 
and yeah. to, and to finally hit print is like just this almost moment where you're like, but it's not ready. It's not there yet. And yet you have, <laughs> and yet you have to kind of let it go. Well, so much magic happens after. Cause like, I remember things like this friend now friend told me, uh, we had met at a conference and then we totally lost touch with each other. And then my first book came out, Loving Kindness. And she, she wrote to me and she said, I was in a bookstore and your book fell on my head. <laughs> and then it became important to me. So let's get back in touch. Or, you know, If that's not the universe telling you something, then I don't know. Yeah, what it really. Is. It's great. So your book actually begins with a beautiful reflection about sitting in the mornings with your grandfather on the porch of his home in Delhi. He is sipping chai and sharing little nuggets of wisdom with you. And that made me so homesick for India. Mm. And your grandfather mm. taught you about the word Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, which is a word many of our listeners know. It's part of the title of your book. In the Buddhist framework, the word in Pali, the language of the original Buddhist text is Dhamma, D-H-A-M-M-A. They've lost a bunch of R's somehow. Yeah. Uh, and it has several meanings, that word. It's often uh, these days used to refer to the teachings of the Buddha or the truth of things, the nature of things. It's one of the three jewels of, of the Buddhist teaching. Some people do define it as the truth. Some use it more to mean your life work or your calling. Mm. So since the word is used many different ways, I'd love to hear what Dharma means to you and how it's the start of your story in your book. Yeah. And after deep diving on all these different ways that the word is used, what I have sort of landed on is this idea of dharma is equal to essence plus expression. Hmm. And, and essence is who you are. And expression is how you show up in the world. And really, dharma is an alignment of who you are with how you show up. And so the closest your, your, your essence and expression are to one another, the more aligned you are with your dharma. That's really fascinating. I'm going to have to think about that for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's something that, you know, it, it, I always find it, I always, as a, as a sort of, you know, computer programmer by training early in my life, I always find it useful to kind of break things down into something that I can I can very simply understand. Equations are kind of how I look at things. And, and um, but but this idea of essence being deeper than an occupation was the hardest part for me to process. Because oftentimes when I grew up thinking about Dharma as a, as a Hindu kid, I would hear the word Dharma and, and I did affiliate it much more with life's calling. But to me, what that really meant was an occupation. You want to be a lot, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a doctor, you want to be an actor. That is, that is your Dharma. But what I began to realize much later in life is that, you know, there, there is an essence about you that is much deeper than an occupation. Um, we love to bring things together. We love to assemble. We love to design. We love to create. We love to inspire others. These are more examples of what an essence are. And that essence can be expressed in many different ways. Um, and to me, that's liberating because as soon as I started to realize that, hey, like, I, I don't need to tie myself to an occupation, one specific occupation, in order to be in my dharma. I felt a lot more loose and, and, and liberalized in life. I, I felt like I could go express this essence of mine, which I think is ultimately to tell stories and to capture, you know, other people's stories and and turn them into things that other people can learn from. I can express that in a lot of different ways as as a writer, as a as a podcast host, as as somebody who now hosts a television show. Um, mm. This is what I this is what I love to do. Now these are all different expressions of the same essence. You make me think also of um, this teaching in, in the Buddhist uh, lineage where they, they talk about how everybody wants to be happy, but it's a very deep meaning of happiness. It's not just the endless pursuit of pleasure or, uh, you know, the ordinary conventional meanings of happiness, but a deep, deep sense of feeling, a sense of belonging, feeling at home somewhere yeah. in this world, in this body, in this mind, with one another on this planet. and. And that kind of integration that you're talking about seems like that would be the true face of happiness. And, you know, we get confused and we hear so many things about where happiness is to be found and we pursue them wildly sometimes, Yeah, but it's not really there. I, I think so many people feel 
uh, trapped right now. Uh, when I um, am out speaking with teams and leaders and working with people who just feel a sense of discontent in their career right now, and I think there's a lot of that out there. I mean, it's it's no it's no surprise you read the news cycle and 85 percent of people in 2023 were looking for new jobs, new careers uh, because they felt too stressed out, too burnt out, um, not satisfied with the job that they currently have. And that's a huge nut number. Um, but I think that one of the things I hear is I feel this, this sense of regret, which is that I had a career path that I really wanted to pursue, but I didn't because it didn't make money or because my parents wouldn't approve. And now I'm too far down the line with this other path that there's no turning back. And so I've kind of resigned myself to, you know, a, a career, a, a sense of work that doesn't quite satisfy me. And I think the good news for, for really anybody who is listening is, is you don't necessarily need to go back in time in order to find your dharma. You can sort of morph wherever you are right now, and you can find your way back to what, what it is. And the reason that's always possible is because there are many, many different ways of expressing your essence. And it may actually be that with some small adjustments to your current life, very, very, very slight changes, you can start to come way more into your dharma than you are at the moment. That also reminds me of um, things I've pondered about how your sense of meaning at work may not be in the job description. It may be in your vision. Yeah. What's important, like kindness or something like that. Yeah, that that's why I wanted to sort of break out of this idea of Dharma being, you know, what your job is, but more about how you show up in the world. I mean, I do think that there are people, you know, I, I after – after uh, selling my my company, I, I joined the faculty at Harvard Medical School, and um, I taught all of these people who were who were very purpose driven. Like they became doctors, they became frontline responders, because because there was a there was a mission behind what they wanted to do. They wanted to take care of people. So it was very clear that at a job description level, they were in their dharma, and yet. Oftentimes, the way we show up for those jobs really matters, right? We can, we can mm -hmm. lose sight. We can lose sight of the fact that we're here for the patient. We can lose sight of the fact that what we do is very important. We can get lost in the minutia. We can get lost in the details. And so the point being that there are people out there that are, I think, that are completely mission-driven, and they are very much in the right place right now, but they don't necessarily feel like they're in their dharma because the way that they're showing up every day doesn't quite feel like who they are. And, and so the reason that I wrote this book wasn't just to say, hey, here's the right job for you, but here is the way that you are, are going to show up every day feeling more like you are yourself and ultimately more in your dharma. I've also seen like uh, kind of a, a different sort of career track where somebody's got a sort of dreary task that they never would have described as the job of their dreams, but um, they somehow bring a force of love and care to it. And I've had people with, you know, terrible setting jobs to my ears uh, saying, you know, I try to treat everyone with respect. In every conversation I have, I try to bring forth this sense of care and compassion. And, and they were feeling a different level of fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is Dr. King's street super speech, right? I mean, you know, sweep the streets like Michelangelo would paint and, and, and bring a sense of service to, to what you do. And, and I, mm -hmm. and I, those to me are the most inspiring stories. I mean, I really, in this book, tried to make sure that I was not focusing on sort of the outlier, you know, billionaire startup stories. It was more kind of like the, it was the nurses, it was the plumbers, it was the painters, it was the assembly mm -hmm. line workers. I grew up you're right outside of Detroit, Michigan, and you know, the, the, my town was hit hard in, during the past couple of um, you know economic recessions. Detroit is always sort of one of those areas that almost feels like it's always kind of going through its own version of a Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And then, so, and then, kind of gritting its way back. Um, but the test for me was, hey, like, I don't want this to be a book that is simply going to resonate with people who are on the coast. If my friends back in Detroit don't understand what I'm writing here about Dharma, then this book isn't worth being published. Mm -hmm. I think it's always interesting for our listeners to hear some of the details of what brought you here and how you came to the, this sort of understanding and this feeling and. In your bio, you describe yourself as being once seen as the face of failure in the New York Times. 
sounds yeah. very painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had a dream as a kid that I wanted to uh, start companies. You know, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And, and that was always very alluring for me. And so I did, you know, what I think a lot of us did at the time, my, my friends, uh, we, we moved to uh, the West Coast and the iPhone had had just come out. And and uh, and I, I sort of gave my shot at being an entrepreneur. And I, the first two companies that I started both failed. And, um, and it was one of these moments when I, I was, I was married at the time I got married and my wife and I, we had our first child. We were living in this shoebox apartment in San Francisco and we pretty much had, had blown through any savings we had. We were in debt or student loans. And, um, and it was like, you know, what, what do I, what do I do? And, and, and I, but I, I really didn't want to give up on this entrepreneurial dream because I, I kind of felt like if I gave up now, I wasn't ever going to come back to it. And so I decided to start a third company. And as I was starting this company, I get a phone call from a conference organizer and she says to me, Hey, we're doing this conference on failure. And you just had these two failures. Would you come talk about it? So I'm, I'm like begrudgingly agree because I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to be, I'm, gonna be I'm, I'm, I'm giving a keynote on failure. This is, this is how far I've, I've fallen. And I'm up there on stage and I'm giving this talk and there's a reporter from the New York times in the audience. I, I didn't know this, but fast forward to a full length article on failure. And it's a, picture, it's a picture of me as the cover of this article. And, oh my gosh. And, and Sharon, I don't know if you remember this, but so this was 2013. And, um, you know, I, at the time, all of a sudden, it seemed like the world was starting to talk about failure in a way they hadn't before. And this article came out right at that time. And the point being that it was, it went viral. You know, it got passed around a lot. Ooh. So... If literally, if there was a point in time when you could have Googled the word failure, like that's it, just the word failure, and my face would oh, have been gosh. like your, <laughs> would have been your top search result. You literally would have been staring at me. I was the, the internet's definition of failure for a while, and um, so I, I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm like this. I'm, I really want to be perceived as a success, right? Like I'm like this. I'm a I'm a son of immigrants. My 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 brother is a is a doctor. He's an on air television correspondent for CNN. His name's Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Big shoes to fill. And I'm like, you know, just trying to be perceived as successful. And here, all of a sudden, according to the New York Times and Google, I am like equivalent to failure. And um, I remember talking at that time to my mom, and my mom says to me, "Listen." use this somehow. Like long-term success comes from short-term embarrassment. If you can do something with it, if you can learn something from it. So take this article and learn something from it. And so what I decided to do is I started to email this article out to all these people that I admired, people who had no idea who I was, like from yeah. Oscar and and so I would literally cold call, like cold email these people. I'd find their email address online. And it was like Oscar winning filmmakers, celebrity chefs, coaches of professional sports teams, leaders of large iconic companies, all the people I admired. And I would just send them a link to this article. And I'd say, hey, as you can see, like, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, would you be willing to <laughs> give me some advice? And I, I, the response rate to that email was just extraordinarily high. Like it, it completely blew my mind. All of a sudden I was getting all these like really warm responses saying, Hey, let's, let's set up time to talk. And not only that, I was speaking with these folks in a way that I feel like they had not, they had not talked to others, meaning because the whole conversation was framed around the idea of failure, they were much more open with me. And all of a sudden I started to have these open, vulnerable conversations with, what I think are some of the most extraordinary people on the planet. And that for me really kind of turned into two different outlets. Number one is I started to write about what I was learning because again, I started to feel like I was having this like collection of data almost that didn't seem to be available online. When I would look up their stories, I would hear about their successes, about their wins, about their achievements, but I was very rarely hearing about their failures. And I certainly wasn't learning about the habits that ended up taking them through the toughest moments. So I started to write about that, but then I also started to apply these learnings into my third startup. My, it was my it was my final stand. If this startup didn't work, I wasn't going to be an entrepreneur. So I started to take these learnings and apply that, and those are the things that ultimately ended up helping me build something that was that ended up being successful. Wow. Well, first of all, kudos to mom, who's got tremendous wisdom. 
Yeah. Uh, and my claim to fame, I think, from the New York Times was this time that I was interviewed about doom scrolling, and I confessed that I did it. So maybe <laughs> I'll, I'll send that out to all these various people that I don't really know and say, help me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me I good. Mean, yeah, I mean, leaning into these parts of us that I guess we'd want to hide sometimes, I guess has yeah. some advantages. And you've talked about this before. You You have taught me this through other avenues. Yeah, no, that's... It's it's beautiful and what a fantastic story. And uh, the other part of it, you know, that really strikes me in your life story is uh, your connection to the lineages of your family and and that wisdom and how that's given you a framework for life. I mean, I was really serious when I said I got homesick for India. You know, yeah. just that image of your grandfather sipping chai, and I can just I can feel India. I can uh, just transport myself back there, and uh, it's not a simple thing. Yeah, you know, it, it, so one of the things I realized when I was I started this this career really then of 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 interviewing and talking to these people who had who I, who I thought had done amazing things, and um, that has gone on for the past ten years. That's really the foundation of my work. I study great leaders around the planet. I write about what I learn about the habits that took them to the top of their game, and then I I host a podcast and I host now this television show around it, um, which is on Amazon Prime, but. The reason I bring all that up is because I also thought to myself, well, wow, like, what about all the leaders that I had been exposed to as a child? What about all these amazing people mm -hmm. um, that I had learned about, including my ancestors? And it really brought me back to, you know, this, this very, very important time in my life when I'm seven years old. I'm, you know, visiting India. We're, we're there for uh, uh, several weeks. And I remember as, as somebody who is, who's jet lagged, I would get up really early in the morning. It was like, you know, first thing. And I would get up and nobody was, nobody was awake inside the house. And we we're in New Delhi and the house, you know, was, is, mm -hmm. you know, our house was sort of like an indoor outdoor type of home, meaning there were no ceilings in certain parts of the house and it was December. So it was chilly. And I remember like grabbing, grabbing my uncle's shawl and like wrapping it around me and like walking through the corridors of the house house to see who was awake and nobody really was until I spotted a figure who was sitting on the front porch. And this is one of the first mornings I was there. And this is my, this is my grandfather, my Bauji. I called him my Bauji sitting on the front porch and I go out there and this is the first time that my Bauji and I have really actually ever met. Like he, and he knows exactly who I am and he waves me over and I sit down next to him. And one of the first things that struck me when we're watching the streets of Delhi sort of come alive, you know, there's fruit cart vendors, there's cows ambling through the streets there, you know, there, there's, there's rickshaws starting to fire up for the day. And I'm, we're just staring out at that. And I remember thinking to myself, like something is really off. Something is really strange about about this moment for me as I kind of like studied my grandfather, like what is it about him that is different? And then the thing that struck me was that he wasn't doing anything. He was just sipping his chai. And to me, that was strange because as an American kid, I was used to like these just crazy frenetic mornings, you know, my, my, my dad with like, you know, a half eaten bagel in his mouth, like tying his tie, my mom, like getting ready for work. Like there's music going in the background, there's the televisions on, it's just chaos. But here I, I, I was seeing this, this, this elderly, this grown up man, right. Who I really admired had heard incredible stories about sitting there doing nothing, but just focusing on sipping each sip of his chai. And it was the first lesson that I learned from him was, hey, like you can do one thing at a time. You don't necessarily need to multitask to get ahead because ultimately, I mean, he marched with Mahatma Gandhi. He was he was an incredible attorney. He was a very well respected member of his community. He got so much done in his life. And even at that point in time, he was he was a very, very productive person. But he was always able to take these moments and just focus on just relaxing and and sipping his chai and really kind of getting himself prepared for the day. That's beautiful. And since your dad was eating a bagel, <laughs> yeah. um, it, I wanted to ask, like, did you feel part of several cultures growing up in the suburbs of Detroit, both Indian and American? And what was that like? Yeah, we, we grew up in pretty much an all white community, um, my brother and I. And uh, there was a time when we were the only, you know, we we're the only brown people in, in, mm -hmm. in the city, in the town. Um, and yeah, I mean, 
it's tough. It's tough sometimes for me to talk about. I, I wrote about this in the book as well because, you know, I, I was ashamed. I had brown skin, and I think when you're different, you you have a choice, and that choice is you can either uh, own it, you can stand out, or you can try to do everything you can to fit in. Mm-hmm. And I tried to fit in. I would um, overwear Bruce Springsteen T-shirts <laughs> that said "Born in the" that said "Born in the USA." I would. Uh, uh, there were times I would I would cake baby powder onto my face to try to make myself look more white because I just wanted to fit in. And um, of course, that didn't work, right? I mean, it's like all of a sudden, like I always showed up as the white mm-hmm. kid, you know. But that was my way of doing anything that I possibly could. Um, but there was a different world, and, and that world was inside our temple. Because even though we, we, we were in this all-white town, we had this temple that was about a half hour away from our house where all of the Indians in the southeastern Detroit area would gather. Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden, I'm around all of these people who look like me, and I would sing budgeons. I would um, you know, serve food at the lunch. I would, I would you know, mingle with the aunties and uncles and soak up their wisdom. And I, I really felt like, okay, I'm, I'm in a place where I sort of belong. Um, but as soon as that temple door swung open, it was like, you know, one world led to another. And I remember mm-hmm. as soon as like, as soon as I'd walk outside the temple door, there was, you know, white guy on his lawnmower mowing his lawn across the street and, 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 uh, you know, Budweiser bottle in his hand. And, and it was just, it, it was like, it was like, it was very sort of, it was tough for me sometimes to reconcile these, these two worlds. So I always saw them as separate and, and, you know, like I'm a father now. And, mm-hmm. and I, I think that one of the most important things for me to do, I think as a parent has been to realize that I don't have to be one or the other, that these two worlds can belong together. You know, I'm not, I'm not an Indian boy or an Indian man and an American child and an American man. I am both. I'm an Indian American and these two identities, they can belong together. And when they are brought together, that's when I can fully become myself. I think it's something that uh, that kind of conversation, I'm glad you put it in the book because it's really important uh, for so many people. And and let's focus on the book uh, for some minutes. And part of what I'm curious about is that I think there's an assumption out there that authors will write on a subject they are experts on. This is something somebody said to me when I was writing a book on faith. Mm. You know, she said, people will assume you're writing a book on a subject like that because you know all about it mm. and and you want to just disseminate your incredible knowledge. But yeah. more commonly, people write a book on a deeper subject because they're trying to learn about it more fully. And the writing itself is a means for more deeply understanding. So I'm curious if that was part of your motivation. It, it always has been. You know, I started writing almost as a form of therapy. I feel like the page always listens. And so just to sit down each morning and just start to write, I would say that in my life as a writer now, um, 90 plus percent of what I've written has gone nowhere. It's, and it's ended up in the trash bin, but that doesn't mean it wasn't valuable. And that's a really important thing for me to have learned is that, you know, instead of writing so that it can get published, you're writing to express and even that expression has a tremendous amount of value. Um, and absolutely, for me, it's always about trying to answer a question, not trying to um, speak an answer. Um, so I, for me, you know, I found myself in a state that I think a lot of people find themselves in, which is that you know, we've been on this path for quite a long time. At this point in time, I'd been on, I'd been working for, you know, 15 years. Um, I had had a lot of misses, but I had also had some success. And the thing that I was feeling is that I just thought life would be different, meaning I thought I was going to be happier. Um, you know, I, I had nothing to really complain about anymore, meaning I had, um, you know, it, it wasn't like things were perfect, but like, I have a nice family. I have, um, I have a job. Um, you know, 
we're able to make ends meet, meaning we're not suffering when it comes to finances. Um, and yet at the same time, I feel this, this almost inexhaustible sense of um, desire that I don't, that it, it, and the dissatisfaction. And I'm like, well, where, where is this coming from? And, you know, I, I wanted to know more. And, and, and as I, as I started to kind of peel back the layers, both on East and West, I was starting to find that, look, we've been talking about this for thousands of years, you know, as, as human beings, there's always sort of been this notion of the difference between inner success and outer success, meaning that you have outer success, which is wealth and status and achievement and inner success, which is really this, this sense of satisfaction and, and fulfillment and, and happiness ultimately. And the mistake that I think that I was making is in believing that outer success is somehow going to lead me to inner success. And, and that's not to say that outer success is bad. It's not to say that like, you know, doing well in your career or, or having achievements, having accomplishments isn't worthwhile. But it's more about the, the, you know, the fallacy that somehow one day you get enough of that and it's going to make you feel fulfilled inside. Um, and I began to realize, as maybe much later than I, than I would have hoped for in life, but I began to realize like that's not true. And so if that's not true, then what, like, what do I need to do to like, do what I want to do in life, meaning I want to actually... I want to actually continue having ambition. I want to continue serving. I want to continue doing all the things that I'm doing, but I want to also feel fulfilled. So how do I have both? And, and that was really the starting point of this book. That's wonderful. It's something I really resonate with and the idea that we can get in touch with our own deeper values and inspirations. And that can be like the North Star by which we can guide our lives, no matter what our particular occupation is. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think, um, Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar, um, may have put this in the best way, which he calls us the arrival fallacy. And the arrival fallacy is this, this notion that one day we're going to reach this point where we have accumulated enough wealth, enough status, enough achievement, where we're finally going to feel whole inside. But the reason it's a fallacy is because for most of us, what ends up happening is that we hit that point or we hit some notion of a point and then the goalpost moves again and then it moves again and it moves again. Right? And, and by the way, this doesn't necessarily just have to happen with big things, you know, meaning that you hit a certain number, a certain amount of money in the bank. It can happen at, at a very sort of, I think, everyday level. You, you know, I think that I'm going to get that next deal or that next client or I'm going to buy the next car or, and, and like these, these, these more sort of, I think, typical things we feel are, go are going to make us happier. And as you know, and you've talked about this, what typically ends up happening for most of us is we feel we will feel that flash of joy. We will feel that flash mm -hmm. of happiness. But then we tend to reset, right? We tend to go back mm -hmm. to a natural mm -hmm. set point. And so and that and that sometimes that that reversion, sometimes going back to that set point can almost make us feel the sense of dissatisfaction that we didn't have before because we're like, oh, I thought that there was that, that thought that was going to be the thing that was going to give me this lasting sense of joy, and it didn't. Yeah, it's like the um, one of the most exciting pieces of research I'd seen was when they talked about uh, meditation practice actually changing that set point. Mm. You know, and of course, many things can, which would have been a big discovery, actually. Um, and your book offers eight practices that help us get in touch yeah. with this deeper sense of self and purpose. And I wonder if you can outline those. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to. So yet, yeah, you know, each chapter is titled with the Sanskrit word. And the reason I did this is because I was looking for words that sometimes capture what I think um, English, you know, the typical English language had not done as effective a job, but there were these powerful Sanskrit words, thousands of years old that I felt like did a better job of really helping us understand this. So the chapter one is Sukha and Sukha is uncovering your essence. So, you know, a Sukha is your authentic state. And this chapter is all about how do we know what that is? How do we start to understand what our Dharma is? Chapter two is Bhakti, Bhakti, which uh, I, I, I label as full hearted devotion. And what I talk about is the difference between fully, between being fully scheduled 
and being full hearted because we can't always be fully scheduled. We have, you know, full time jobs. We have, we have kids, we have aging parents. We have all sorts of things that are on our plate. Can't always give all of ourselves to our Dharma, but, but being full hearted is something that we can always do even amongst all the other busy things in our life. Chapter three is prana, which is energy. It's really about having extraordinary energy because without energy, if we're exhausted, we, we can't really be in our Dharma. Chapter four is upeka, which is really about finding comfort in the discomfort. Um, you know, Viktor Frankl talked about this as equanimity, a sense of equanimity, a distance between, you know, how we respond to the difficulties in life and that distance being our path to freedom. Chapter five, which is probably the hardest for me, is Lila, which is high play. And it's really about blurring the boundaries between work and play. And I think that you do this so well, Sharon. Like I've been part of your courses and seminars, and I think you just have fun with what you're Mm -hmm. doing. There's a sense of joy that really shines through. And I love that about you. And I want more of it. Like I really am like envious of like that. Like I want that. Um, But that was the hardest chapter for me to write because it's also just like one of these things is hard for me. Chapter six is Seba which is about service, selfless service. Um, I call it forgetting yourself to find yourself. And that is really the quote from Mahatma Gandhi, who said that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Chapter seven is Tula. Tula. And Tula is really this, this high balance of how do we let go and also take charge at the same time. So this give and take between force and trust. And where is that sweet spot for you? And finding that so that you can get into this sense of high balance. And then the last chapter is really Kriya. And Kriya is action. It's really how we sort of bring all of this stuff into action. Because, you know, Dharma is active. It is, it is not just being. It's not just doing. But it's really doing from the depths of your being. And so Kriya is all about how action actually leads us to courage versus this idea of courage leading us to action, we can flip that simply by starting to act. And every time we act, courage catches up along the way. It's beautiful. And in a way, it feels like kind of like a roadmap more than singular practices because of the way they relate to each other. It's like forms a an integrated whole more. Is that how it feels to you? It, it does. It does. Oh. And it didn't, it didn't always, but I feel like uh, as the book started to unfold, something did happen in this book that did not happen for my last book, which is that it just felt like one chapter was leading to the other. As I was finishing, as I was finishing one chapter, I would always end with a question. And the question was, okay, but then what about this? Right. So for example, with Upeka, which is all about finding comfort in the discomfort. There are all these uncomfortable situations in our lives. And I and I wrote about that and all this, uh, all the pain that we can go through and how do we get through that and what are some everyday rituals. But at the end of that chapter, I, I started to think to myself, wow, this sounds really, really serious. Like this is just about like having like like getting through these very difficult situations. How do I lighten things up in my life? Like, how do I start to invite in a sense of joy? And that's what led to the next chapter, which was all about Leela and high play and so on and so forth. That's really great to uh, discuss because sometimes I think we see a list. It's like the Eightfold Path and we think it's sequential yeah. uh, kind of inherently in that. And also that, that leads to the feeling like, well, I've done with that. That's like number one, you know, like now I'm on to number two. Yeah. Uh, never to visit number one again, you know, and and it's not like that. It's all kind of an interplay constantly. I've heard you talk about this before, and I think I've heard uh, Tara Brock talk about this mm-hmm. as well, which is like, look, this is not, the work is not a set of steps, which I always thought it was, meaning mm-hmm. that if I got past step one and I'm on a step two, then I should never have to go back to step one. And that's, that's just right. not the way it works. And I think that you have put it brilliantly before, which is that it's much more a, a vision of a cycle than it is yeah. a step. Yeah. We're constantly cycling. And that means all the bullshit that you feel like you got past, it will come up again because you, we, are, we are constantly cycling. We are winning. We are losing. We are advancing. We are, we are pedaling backwards. But the beauty, I think the optimism is not in the fact that you will never have to deal with your stuff again. I think the beauty is that every time you go through the cycle, there is an opportunity for you to just get a little bit better at the movement. 
Mm-hmm. And and that and that is really, I think, one of the sort of I think poetries that I love about Dharma, which is like it is the center, you know, the wheel of Dharma is the center of the Indian flag. And when my Bauji first pointed me to that, you know, he said, This wheel is going to continue to spin, and that is your life, right? And I didn't know this at the time, but what he was really saying is, look, you're gonna win, you're gonna lose, you're gonna succeed, you're gonna fail. Little did he know that literally 30 years later, I was gonna be <laughs> the poster child for failure for the New York right. Times. But but you know, it's it's one of these things where like the wisdom that you get, um, it sticks with you, and then you don't know when it's going to become useful, when it's going, when its voice is going to be heard again. Um, and, and that's, you know, to me, it's, it's, it was, is all things coming together. You know, I think for many of us, one of the most challenging parts of that process that you're describing is that after we have uncovered our essence, as you put it, then we inevitably might lose sight of it or we get distracted or we feel just too busy, you know, to get back in touch with that yeah. deeper part of ourselves. And then we, we lose confidence. So yeah. Maybe we have found that that sense of essence, but or maybe we encounter then a big loss or a failure, and we get disheartened. And so um, that you know comes back to really what you're talking about, which is that things are often messy or rocky, and and uh, it's important to know our essence in those times. You know, maybe most particularly. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think that's right, and, and you know, I think for me, you know, it's like it's like there have been so many times that I've had articles rejected, I've had book ideas tossed aside, uh, you know, and and I think I think in those in those moments, it can be it can be sort of I think um, only normal to question whether you know what you're doing is the right path. I think for me, the big lesson has been starting to base my essence more on how I feel rather than how other people respond, which is not always easy. But at the same time, if you feel this energetic lift when you're doing the work, when you are, when you're losing track of time because, you know, you love it so much, then you know that this is your path, right? And, and that's why I think like belief is such a big part of all of this is having faith in this thing that lights you on fire and continuing to do it. And, and, and by the way, I think, this is, I think this has a lot more to do. There's a lot more parallels between Dharma and love than I've ever sort of given it credit for. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like for me, like my wife and I, we talk about this all the time. We have two young kids. We have an 11 year old and a seven year old. And Sharon, like at six thirty in the morning, our house just goes absolutely berserk. Uh-huh. It's like it's like the kids are up, they're yelling at each other. I'm trying to make breakfast. My wife, you know, she's she's a full time editor for for a news publication, so you know her stories are coming at her, and we're trying to make it all work. And sometimes we say to ourselves, like like in a perfect world, of course, my wife and I would go do vacations with each other, or we would have frequent date nights where we could spend you know some loving time with one another. But the fact is that we're not. We, 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 we're not very good at that. And it's a very hard time for us to be disciplined about that. But the one thing that we are really good at is that from 6.15-ish to about 6.30, we sit down together and we have coffee. Mm-hmm. And it's before the house, well, the house is still quiet. When we get to look into each other's eyes, we get to, we get to listen, we get to hear each other, we get to, we get to say I love you and, and have it not be interrupted. And it's just 15 minutes in, in a full day. Right. But that 15 minutes is really the bedrock of our relationship. And I think the same thing is true for your Dharma. You know, the fact is that you're not, you may not have a life where you get to spend day in and day out with it. You may not be in a situation where you're constantly being given credit for the work that you're doing towards your Dharma. But I do think that it is just like love, it is a it is a consistent relationship. And even spending minutes with it every single day with this thing that you love, and even just like literally telling this thing that you love, I love you. Like, I love this side of me. I love this part of me. Um, It matters so much more than, you know, taking a long break and spending one month with it, but then going back into your normal life and turning your back on it. That's really wonderful. And, you know, as you tell that story, which I thought was fabulous about you and your wife, I kept thinking, wow, it's only 15 minutes. Look at that. Yeah. You know, that, that, you know, sometimes we feel so disheartened because we think, I don't have all day to do this and but for me 615 in the morning would be a big sacrifice you know <laughs> like so 
<laughs> nonetheless, you know, putting in the effort and it's not, it's just something so renewing and, and about uh, that, that reminder, oh, this is what I really care about. Yeah. Yeah. So this all brings up the question for me of how you are defining success, you know, because the words in your subtitle, and it's a word that often gets weirdly defined, um, like in meditation practice, a lot of people might think that a successful meditation session is one where you don't have a single thought, you know, which is not really the point of, of meditation practice. It's much more about how we are relating to the thought or maybe the cascade of thoughts that's arising. So yeah. in living everyday Dharma, what does success look like? I think success is expression, expressing who you are. Um, so I think it has a lot more with the way that you show up in the world than it does with the way that people respond to you. Um, not meaning necessarily that you need to say, I don't care about other people or I don't care about the way that others respond. That's, that's, not, that's not the truth. But the truth, I think, is that inner success is very much coming from this feeling of fulfillment from the work you're doing independent of the way that other people are responding to you. Um, and so, you know, in the book, one of the things that I talk about is this idea of getting to your dharma is kind of like in a lot of ways, the way that Michelangelo would look at a block of marble mm -hmm. and say, hey, the sculpture is already inside. We just need to chisel away the layers that are in its way in order to kind of let this thing reveal itself. And, and Sharon, I know you talk about this as well, which is like it's already inside of you. And resting mm -hmm. into that place is really, really important. In the book, I talk about the questions, some of the questions that have let me sort of peel back these layers, chisel away these layers. And one of the questions is, what would I do if, I, if nobody really knew about it? Right, like if I if I didn't have a social media profile, or if I wasn't being compensated, it wasn't part of my bio, um, it wasn't like the thing that everybody knew me as. What would I be doing anyway? Um, and that can be a really important question to ask yourself. Right, if no one knew, what would I do anyway? Because that can sort of I think reveal a truth for yourself. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to not share your work with the world. It doesn't necessarily mean you don't need to care about you know how people perceive your work. But what it does mean is that there's a greater satisfaction. There's a greater fuel that is inside your body, that is inside you, that is that that wants this. Um, one of my one of my favorite stories is when Dr. Martin Luther King was thinking about stepping into his role uh, in in the civil rights movement, right? And to be to to be a leader. And sometimes I forget how young he really was. I mean, when Dr. Mm -hmm. King gave his I have a dream speech, he was already several years into his role as a leader and he was only 26 years old when he gave mm -hmm. that speech. Right. So I mean just think about it. Like if he was alive today stepping into the into the role that he stepped into, he would be a Gen Zer. Right. And in, in 2024. Wow. Right. And like an, like a young Gen Zer. And, and, and like the thing is that that like that's an incredible that's an incredible burden to take on. And he went to go see a mentor of his, a guy named Howard Thurman. And he said to him, look, look, I, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. And one of the things that he said to his mentor is, I believe, though, that the world needs this right now. And what Howard Thurman, Dr. King's mentor, said to him is, don't just ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs more than anything else is more people who have come alive. And I think that's such an, I think that's such an interesting way to really think about Dharma as well, right? We do want to serve. We do want to, we do want to provide value to other people. And that is an important part of all of this. But I think it also, I think, behooves us to separate that and to really think about what is it independent of all of that that makes us come alive, right? So for me, for example, when I was, when I was running my startup, it became pretty clear to me pretty quickly that like managing teams and being like a startup CEO and that wasn't my dharma right like but what i was able to do is i was able to start tuning into what were the moments of my day that i would just continue to do no matter how people reacted no matter what happened because it just lit me up and the the one part of my day that i loved was whenever i could hear a customer story 
whenever I was on the phone with a customer and they were telling me we had a healthcare service, we did one-on-one health coaching. So we were helping people who were struggling with diabetes and heart disease and at risk for diseases that they, they, they would come to our platform. We would help them get into a better, better health condition. And whenever I could hear their stories, um, what they were going through, how they were, how they were actually doing on the platform and ideally how they were succeeding and, and getting into, you know, better shape. Those were, those were like, so inspiring for me that I would like literally rush out of my office and I would like want to tell everybody. I would want to tell my team. I want to tell our partners. I want to tell our investors. And that lit me up. And it was almost to me as if they didn't really matter to me how they were responding because it was something that I just needed to express. And so coming back to like, what is the definition? If you are expressing your essence, if there is something inside of you that wants to speak and you are speaking it, you are expressing it, even if in that's in a way that nobody else is paying attention to, I still believe that is true success. That's wonderful. And one of my other favorite quotations from Howard Thurman, uh, aside from this, which is really extraordinary, was when he said, um, look at the world with quiet eyes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I use it a lot to sort of describe the nature of Meditation. I actually wanted to name a book that once, and the publisher didn't agree. So, I think it's still available. <laughs> if you uh, if you're writing another book, I don't know if that's in your in your plans, but uh, I, I offer that. it as a title. Yeah, I I, 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 I love it, and I think it's beautiful. Eyes. It's it's so funny. You had you had Jerry you had Jerry Colina on your show. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and um, you know, Jerry one time was was um, yeah, he's one of the first people who was who was sort of teaching me how to meditate. This is years mm-hmm. ago. And I still remember I was with him in Colorado and we were doing an eyes wide open meditation. And, um, and he was looking at me and all of a sudden he's like, Hey, you're not supposed to be like laser beams into like this <laughs> object. You're supposed to be gazing at it. And I'm like, what does that, what does that even mean? I, I don't like, if I'm looking at something, I'm looking at something I'm, I'm staring at it. That's, isn't that the point? And he's like, no, like that's your drishti, that's your focal point, but you're not supposed to like try to like, you know, you're not trying to Jedi move this thing, <laughs> you know, and, and he gave me a really useful tip, um, which I come back to often whenever I'm doing eyes open meditation, which is like, you're, you're really looking at the distance between your eyes and the object, right? Mm-hmm. And when you can look at the distance between your eyes and the object, your eyes will begin to soften. And, um, that's true. That, that, that's very true. And, and I, I sometimes, even when I'm sitting at my desk and I'm like really feeling my fists start to clench up or I'm starting to feel my body clench up because I'm going through like a stressful moment, I'll really try to take that tip and I'll say, instead of looking at my screen directly, looking at the words on my screen, I'm just going to soften. I'm going to look at it with quieter eyes and I'm going to just focus on the distance between my eyes and the object for a moment. And it always helps. Something because really what we're doing then is tuning into space, you know, and mm. uh, which is uh, obviously an expansive and an open thing. Um, so maybe my last question, because unfortunately we have to stop. Although someday I hope we just can continue this on in person yeah. um, in some way. But um, because so many people these days seem to be experiencing loneliness and disconnection, and so much so that it's called an epidemic. Um, you know, I've, I've long said, because I was paying attention to this even before the pandemic, where, um, you know, as I would read studies about how social connection could be, uh, you know, a very valuable um, resource in terms of different clinical conditions, I kept thinking, well, it can't just be a numbers game. Like, I only have three friends. I need eight. It must yeah. be some inner sense of connection. Yeah. And so, you know, this idea of c- returning to one's essence, feeling unified, uh, I wonder if you could say something about how it promotes the sense of connection with others. Yeah, I, I think about this myself. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, when we are in our essence, I think we, um, I think we just naturally become a lot more vulnerable. Um, and the reason is because, you know, it's no longer about just the outside achievements, but it's about this thing that you want to bring into the world. And I think when you when you're at that sort of level with yourself, you become more vulnerable. And and I do think that vulnerability 
really is the bridge to connection. I mean, I, I learned this by accident when I became the poster child for failure mm-hmm. for the New York Times. But when I started to reach out to people saying, hey, like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm literally the internet's definition of failure. That's when people started to open up to me. And believe me, as like an ambitious 20 something, I was sending those kinds of emails before all the time being like, Hey, you know, look at all these amazing things that I've done in my life. Would you have coffee with me? And very, very little response to that. But when I opened up and I was like, Hey, listen, like I'm, I'm on this path and I'm struggling right now, but this is what I want to do. The, the level of connection that I was able to feel with others uh, really opened up. You know, I learned this lesson again when I was, when I was running my startup, which is that I would have one of the most important things that I ever did was assembling a group of people who were entrepreneurs like myself, but critically, none of them were successful, meaning we were all trying, mm-hmm. but we, we all were facing that same, you know, success rate, which is like one out of 10 startups make it and nine out of 10 fail. So mm-hmm. we don't know what's going to happen, right? But we were all going through it together. And once a month, we would come to uh, a place, you know, casual dinner spot, and we would just sit around the table and we would just talk. And our our single most important rule at that time was no selling, meaning mm-hmm. you're not you're not selling. You certainly you're not selling your product, but you're also not trying to sell a perception that you're killing it right now. There's none of that. You have to be completely open and honest, not just about what's going well, but what's not going well. And it's been very interesting for me as I've been out in the world now, I've gone to many different countries, studied many, many different leaders, hundreds of leaders over the past 10 years. This is, I think, the common denominator is that those who have been able to build momentum in their lives, they've been able to keep going, they always have a circle of people around them that they can be completely vulnerable with. Meaning they're not just going to them and sharing the Instagrammable stories about like the times they killed it. They're, they're able to talk about the things that are falling off the rails, the things they need help with, and not just in the professional way, but in their personal way. You know, I have a kid at home that's suffering from depression and I need some help with her, you know, with, with being part of her life, things like that. Having a circle of people that you can be open with and just to show that like, Hey, like I'm trying here. This is what I want. But, but there's also a lot of things that I'm suffering with is, has, has always been important. It's something you've written about for a very long time, but my gosh, my gosh, it is, it is more important than ever right now. Well, well, thank you so much for being here today. I'm hoping that before we finish, if you could lead us in one of your reflections from the book to bring our conversation to a close. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've talked about my, my grandfather, my Bauji and, and how this book really starts and and I'll 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 share with you a few paragraphs and and if you're listening right now you might even you might even uh close your eyes for a moment and I'll read to you just a few paragraphs in the book about how my bauji introduced me to the concept of dharma. So here we go. There's an urgency to bauji this morning. In a couple of hours, my parents and I will be catching a flight back to the United States and there seems to be one final lesson that my grandfather wants to impart. Bauji raises a large hand, and he points to an Indian flag raised from a structure down the street. You see the center of that flag, Beta? He asks, calling me son, the way that my parents do. I gaze in the direction of his finger and notice the orange, white, and green banner gently blowing in the wind. At the heart of the flag is a navy blue wheel. That, he says, is the Ashoka Chakra. The Wheel of Dharma. Bauji then begins to draw the shape of a wheel in the air. He traces and retraces its perimeter, each time picking up speed. He draws faster and faster until he's maniacally rounding the circle. His seriousness has shifted to play. His eyes are smiling. I let out a giggle. I'm seven years old, and he unleashes a giant belly laugh that I'm sure will wake my cousins who are sleeping inside. My grandfather then takes a long sip of his hot chai, and I watch the steam rise from the mug and slightly fog his large frame glasses. He removes them, and I see what look like tiny tears welling at the corners of his dark brown eyes. Perhaps Bauji knew that this would be the last time we'd ever see each other. He tells me that as I get older, the wheel will move faster. Time will accelerate, years will squish together, 
Each birthday will arrive a little sooner than the one before. And as the wheel turns faster and faster, life will pull me to the outside, away from who I really am at my core, away from my dharma. That's when Baoji takes a deep breath and begins the journey that you and I are about to take together. Beta, he says for the final time, you must always find your way back to the center. Thank you, Sharon. Wow. Oh, thank you so much. It's, it's really, it's been uh, so beautiful being here with you together. And um, I hope we can do it again soon. I'm going to go make myself a cup of chai, really, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I cannot wait for our, our, our Indian meal together, whether that be in New York or Los Angeles. It would be wonderful. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Sunil's work, you can check out his website, which is sunilgupta.com, S-U-N-E-E-L-G-U-P-T-A.com. And his book, Everyday Dharma, is available in all the places, so we highly recommend you get yourself a copy. And for all things Sharon, including online courses, or many books, and maybe you want a free guided meditation, you can head over to the website, SharonSalzberg.com. This has been the Meta Hour podcast brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you live with ease. <laughs>